Hey, this is the HVAC School Podcast. I'm Brian. And this is the podcast that helps you remember some stuff, okay? That's what it comes down to. We're going to even abbreviate the intro. Just helps you remember some stuff. And today's episode is about five things to consider when doing a maintenance on a commercial package unit, or at least a light commercial package unit, because some package units can get pretty big. There's some similarities and maybe some differences depending on tonnage and brand, but we're going to go over five things. We're not going to go over everything, just five things, all right? So chill. But first, I want to thank our great sponsors, Carrier, Mitsubishi Electric Cooling and Heating. I also want to thank UEI and the HubSmart Kit, but also the WRS Scales. If you haven't looked at the wireless WRS Scales from UEI and Arbiter, my friend Adolfo over there is the designer of the WRS Scales as well as the Hub Kit. I would encourage you to take a look at them because they're really good scales. I really like them. They're the scales I prefer at my company, Kalo Services. And you can find those by going to ueitest.com. Also, big thanks to Refrigeration Technologies at refrigetech.com, R-E-F-R-I-G tech.com, makers of all kinds of great chemicals. They really try to make them safe, good for the environment, and effective in the field. That's what Refrigeration Technologies is out to do. John Pastorello, I met him at AHR, and we've interacted on email a few times. He's given me both positive and negative feedback on things that I've said in the past, and I appreciate that. And then also Air Oasis, makers of the Bipolar and Nano air purification products. If you haven't taken a look at these products yet, then I would encourage you to do so. If your distributors do not sell these products, then I would ask them why not, because they are good products. They're made in the USA. Very, very good companies. And then also bizpal.org is a company that I just used to find a technician. If you are in the market to recruit, I would encourage that you look at bizpal.org. It's Patrick Long's in the groups. You can interact with him. He's a good guy, smart guy, been in the trade a long time, and he can help you find a technician if you're a manager or an owner of a business. So, but now we're talking about five things to consider when maintaining a commercial package unit. Again, this isn't everything. This is just a list of things, especially if you're a resi tech, you cut your teeth on resi the way I did, and then you find yourself doing some commercial. These are things that you need to make sure that you don't forget. And you should have a more in-depth list than this. You should follow what manufacturers say, but these are some things just to make sure you don't forget. feels like I've mentioned this. So here we go. First thing is, is that I want you to wash fresh air filters. If you are not thinking, and if we say fresh air, air is not always that fresh. In Florida, it can actually be quite high humidity. It's outdoor air, okay? But you need to make sure that if you've got an outdoor air hood, if you've got an economizer, you're bringing an outdoor air, you need to make sure that you're washing those filters. Don't let them get all gummed up. That's fairly obvious. Some of them are like aluminum filters, but you got to make sure you wash them. Don't forget to wash them. The next thing is one of the more disputed topics as far as how it should be done, and that is to check and adjust belt tension. A lot of techs will say, ah, you want about half inch of deflection or one inch of deflection, and then they'll kind of show you their pinching fingers. That varies quite a bit tech to tech. And so setting proper belt tension and, and adjusting it, making sure that they're adjusted in each direction correctly is a very important part. I'll tell you, when I first started doing commercial maintenance, I had a couple big accounts at my first job. I kind of got thrown into it. I would get belts far too tight because I didn't like them squealing, right? And so when you get a belt too tight, that results in high amperage on the blower, blower motor. It usually leads to the belt breaking or throwing pretty soon thereafter. Stretching, so the belt will just keep stretching the more you keep tightening it and excessive bearing wear. And again, it depends on the particular belt, depends on the particular equipment. But in many cases, we're tightening belts when we really should be replacing them. When they start getting worn down enough that you have to do significant amounts of tightening as it's wearing, it's probably time to replace it. Here's kind of my general rule of belt tension, and there's a more accurate one that I'll cover. But you want the belt to be tight enough that it doesn't slip at all or vibrate excessively, but no tighter. So as tight as it needs to be and no tighter. A lot of newbies get belts too tight. The ones who look at the belts at all. So there's some who just totally ignore them, and then those tend to be too loose. But for the ones who pay attention or trying to do a good job, they tend to get them too tight because they don't want to risk having a squeal, but that causes stress on the bearing, stress on the motor. So the way I generally will say it is you want it to be tight enough that it doesn't squeal or flop around, but no tighter than that. Many techs, again, like I mentioned, we'll talk about the half-inch deflection rule, but that's just a guess. That's No manufacturer is going to tell you the half-inch deflection rule. The best thing to do is to get a browning belt tension tool and use that. They've got great charts in with that tool. It's a very inexpensive tool that will show you how to do it. And then as you become more skilled in using it, you'll get a better feel for what proper tension is and what isn't. Again, always follow manufacturer specs, but really in order to do a good job, you're going to need a tool to do it. And there are several different tools, but the Browning belt tension tool is a nice inexpensive tool. All right, next thing, number three on the list is to align pulleys. 
Aligning pulleys means that you need to make sure that the pulleys are in line with each other, and it's not the edge of the pulleys. A lot of people want to align the edges. And again, real quick, we need to define the difference between a pulley and a shiv, spelled like sheave. There's a lot of different opinions out there about what the difference is, and if you look on Wikipedia, it's different than the next site you check. Most of the time, we will call it a sheave or a shiv if it's an adjustable pulley, so one where you can adjust how high the belt sits in it. And we'll generally call that a shiv. That's sort of the term that's used in the field most often. And so in some of those, you can adjust them in order to produce more or less CFM. You definitely do not want to do that unless you know what you're doing. That's something that really only a professional, really only if you're doing a test and balance, should you be adjusting that. But the thing to know is, is that you'll often have pulleys and shivs that are of different widths. And so you have to line up the centers of the pulleys in order to make sure that you're not going to wear belts in an improper way. So that's an important thing. Make sure to get those pulleys aligned properly. And it's not just a matter of getting the two pulleys aligned, but making sure that the pulleys themselves are also square. If the motor mounts are out of square, then the pulleys will also be out of square. So you want to make sure that they're square. You can do all kinds of crazy stuff. You can take strings and put it down the center and then measure to the edge. That's a method. You can use the old tried and true straight edge. Some people use fancy laser alignment tools, but really it comes down to having a good sense of square more than anything else. I mean, most of us are doing this sort of by sight. But again, if it's a long distance or you're having a hard time with it, you can use a string and measure off of a flat surface. You can use a straight edge. You can use the fancy lasers. It really just depends on the particular application and how far the belt is, whether or not those things you find to be necessary. But it is important that you're making sure that everything is all square. The next thing is washing condenser coils properly. And the reason why this can be tricky on some of these units, and this is also true of residential, but in commercial especially, a lot of times you're going to have to split the condenser coils, which means you're literally going to have to pull the coils apart and put it on something like a piece of wood or something as you separate them and get in between the coils in order to get them properly cleaned. I know it sounds like a nightmare. Most of you probably haven't done it before. It isn't as bad as it sounds, but it is a process. Whenever you have a split coil, a coil where there's two coils in one, you're going to tend to get stuff built up in between those two coils. Now, how often it happens, it's going to depend on the coil. It's going to depend on how much stuff there is in the air. But you'd be shocked at how much crap can build up in between those coils. And when you go to that system that's got the high head pressure and you're like, the coil's clean. I don't know why it's so high. I can bet you it's probably a split coil and there's a bunch of junk built up in between it. So separating those coils apart and cleaning them well is a really big part of a commercial maintenance if that's the situation that you've got. We have a video on our YouTube channel that somebody did for us that I really appreciated that shows splitting and washing a condenser coil. So you can go look that up and that will help illustrate that better. But it is something you need to definitely keep in mind. The final thing that you're going to see whenever you get to three-phase equipment is checking phase balance. And so when you have imbalance in phases, that can mean death to a motor. I mean, it can cause all kinds of havoc. So in some cases, you're already going to have a phase monitor in place. If the phase monitor is in place, that's great, so long as it's wired and set up properly. But keep in mind that if you have a phase balance of more than 2%, then that's going to cause some trouble, and over 4% is, like, totally unacceptable. And so we have a calculator for checking phase imbalance on the voltage side. So it's just a matter of checking the voltages in between all three legs. In most cases, they're going to be very similar within a volt or two, and then that's acceptable. But it's when you start to see more than a volt or two of variation between the three legs, that's when you want to check and see where you are. And there's some math you can do because you're actually going to the average. So you're taking an average and then you're seeing what the variation is between the farthest variations and the average. But if you go to the resources page on HVAC School, HVACRschool.com, we have calculators there and the voltage imbalance calculators right there in the resources tab. So you can find that there if you want to learn more about that. But that's another thing to definitely check whenever you're working on any three-phase equipment is checking phase balance. And that's it. That's the list of five because this is a short podcast. I could come up with a lot of different things, but that is five items that I think you should think about and I think you should check when you're doing a maintenance on a commercial piece of equipment, especially a commercial package unit. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Thanks for all you do. You can check out all the other podcasts that we do by going to bluecollarroots.com. That's bluecollarroots.com. And don't forget our friends over at True Tech Tools, T-R-U Tech Tools.com. Use the offer code Get Schooled for a great discount. And while you're there, take a look at Refrigeration Technologies products. All right, have a great one. We'll talk to you next time on the HVAC School Podcast. (laughs) 